Okay, everyone, it's already 8.59, so I guess I'll at least get started with a word of prayer. So, Paul, I'm going to lead with a word of prayer, okay? All right, here we go. All right. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time that we graciously have with you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for the opportunity for me to even know Carl, Lord Jesus, and be able to fellowship with him, Lord Jesus, and to just have a basic conversation of, about several topics, Lord. I thank you for everyone else that has been on the phone and contributed. I thank you for the people who are on the phone today, Lord Jesus, that we can all just listen and at least get a great word from you and that you'll speak to all of our hearts through the Holy Spirit and move us to a greater light that extends our power, Lord Jesus. It extends our power with the Holy Spirit and it, it makes us realize exactly who you are through love and service, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Yeah, I appreciate today, you Paul? lifting me up here, man. appreciate that. Oh, no, no. My <laughs> pro- no problem, man. Yes, well, sir. You, as you know before, I don't like to give you uh, really what I'm going to talk about because I like <laughs> it to be <laughs> I like it to be, <laughs> to be smaller. I got you. And, and just an instant reaction. So I did tell you that we're going to talk about service, but particularly we're going to speak about service through love through the context of love, okay? Amen. So, again, for anybody, who, if, it's this, if this is your first time ever being with us, uh, we're really studying spiritual disciplines, and spiritual disciplines are just the different characteristics of Christ, right? So um, we're trying to be disciplined in order to be a better disciple. So part of the root word of discipline is being a disciple. So a disciple must be disciplined. And as I wrote here, it's a consistent habit in one's life that no matter the circumstance, no matter what's going on in your life, it's going to repeatedly bring you back to God. Ultimately, it should be able to transform you and replace old habits that you have prior. Okay? So this week, we're particularly speaking about service. And uh, there isn't an exact uh, Christian standpoint on the word service, but I did take the... um, the Merriam-Webster version's dictionary of the word service, okay? And the the first component, it says to an act, well, it's an act of helpful activity, help, aid. Number two, it's the supplying or or supply of utilities or commodities as water, electricity, or gas required or demanded by the public. And number three, it's the providing of a or a provider of accommodation and activities required to the public as maintenance, repair. So, Carl, I think I I put this definition on the slide because I think in the context of just love in general, because really we're going to speak about love and service, right? Mm -hmm. In order to serve well, you need to illustrate some type of love. That's right. And the the first definition I I have is an act, right? So an act, I said, I, I bolded the word act because it has to be action. Right. So too many people are trying to serve without really doing anything. They think just because they give their money that it was really much action. Sometimes that can be done. But mm-hmm. as, we'll, as we'll look through several verses, um, we can, there's so much more that we can do besides money. Right? It's, That's right. It's, really, it's really putting into work. It's showing that illustration that we care. Right? It's an act. So as it says here, it's an act of helpful activity. So in order to serve, it needs to be helpful activity. Mm-hmm. I think from this context, we can also state there are several people um, throughout our lives, and I, I think context is very important, because somebody may think that they're helping you when they're really not helping you. <laughs> well said. Right? So there's people that think that they're serving us when they're really not serving us. So throughout this whole conversation, Carl, and we're going to put it in the context of marriage. Right, okay, because cool. I think it, and I think everyone can relate to a, a certain type of relationship that they've had in the past. So every type of thought process here, I'm going to connect it to relationships, right? So in in a marriage, how are you really serving your your mate if you're not helpful in your activity? That's a great question. I mean, you're you're obviously not, <laughs> right? You know, so yeah. I I think too many people they get into these relationships and they have in their mind frame, what help is, and they try to infuse what help is. So I've I've, uh, dated people in the past, and I may say, 
you know what, I need help with maybe uh, filing this cabinet, right? Mm-hmm. They don't want to file the cabinet. They're going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to cook for you. And I may say, but I don't need food. I need you to file this cabinet. Right. So, so th- there is a difference of opinion here. They believe they are serving. Why? Because the, the world has told them if you cook, if you clean, that you're a magnificent, magnificent, virtuous wife, and you've done all the great things that a man can want. But when we're serving, we have to put in the context of that person and if they really want that service. Right. And in addition, I would also state, I would go as far as saying that uh, a lot of times we tend to uh, lean on what we want to do and yes. claim those as acts of service. You know, I may like to cook, you know, but yes. I may not like to throw out the garbage or whatever. So if I'm asked to take out the garbage, I may just defer to cooking and thinking that that is satisfying <laughs> the need of the person. But and the, <laughs> and just because I like doing that, and it is yeah. an act of service, yes. Yeah. It's a great service to cook, but it's not necessarily the service that was asked of me. So, yeah. you know, it's still, still, we're still at the same, even though I am acting and I'm doing something uh, to serve, uh, because I'm not doing what was asked of me to do, it's, it's, it's not that it's null and void, but it's not serving the appropriate purpose. Ah, you, break, you bring up a good point. And I'm going to give you an example here, and I want you to ask uh, to, to answer the question. Now, okay. So I'm the professor, and you're the student, right? Let's go. So I'm, I'm going to say, if I gave you an assignment, mm-hmm. and instead of the assignment that I, gave, that I gave you, you gave me a totally different assignment. And with mm-hmm. that assignment, it was awesome. It was great. If that was the real assignment, you would have gotten an A. I would have said, man, this is the greatest project I've ever seen. But what grade should you get if you gave me something great, but that I, that isn't what I was asking for? You failed. What you What did you say? You failed at the task. The task was to do, uh, you know, a plan A or whatever to to type to give me an A uh, paper uh, based on the subject that I gave you. But if you give me something that's completely different, it could be the greatest thing in the world. It could be awesome. But if I now give you something that's completely different. You can, and this has happened to me in the past, <laughs> where yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm back, I'm back in school now, and I'm trying to, uh, you know, complete my undergrad finally, and then eventually yeah. move to uh, seminary and so forth. So I actually yeah. had a class. It was a uh, a class based on Old Testament survey, and yeah. um, I did something that was completely different than what the teacher asked me to do. And uh, yeah. when he gave me the uh, the grade back, you know, me, I'm 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 on a journey to try to get you know great grades and all that. The grade wasn't what I expected, and I thought I did a great job. And he confirmed yeah. that it was a great job. But because it wasn't what he asked for, I got the lower mark. Yes, yes. Now we're going to put it in the context of having a purpose for God. Mm-hmm. If God tells us that we're supposed to be X, and, we're, and I'll give you an example. Maybe God is saying for people don't want to go into ministry. Obviously, it isn't as lucrative uh, <laughs> to some people as far as money or, mm-hmm. or maybe they don't want to be a missionary, go overseas. They, they want to be something more lucrative as far as what the American dream tells them in the United States, right? So with that being said, uh, maybe God is telling you to maybe become a minister, but you don't want to become a minister. Maybe you end up being, uh, when we talk about the American dream, pe- people often say doctor, lawyer, right? So let's just use that as an example. Not that I think that that's the greatest thing in the world. There are other occupations, but mm-hmm. let's just use what uh, people normally say. So you can become the greatest doctor. You can write all these books. You can become the greatest surgeon. Mm-hmm. But if that isn't what God told you to do, what grade do you think he's going to give you? Yeah, you're going you're gonna to get an F, man. That's going to be one of those moments where, depart from me, I never knew you. I believe that's, you know, scripture, yeah. <laughs> you know. If you're Absolutely. doing your own thing, you know, because the thing is, the scripture says it clearly too. We can't uh, serve two masters, you know, and yeah. people automatically assume that that's talking about the devil, you know, and you know, mm-hmm. the devil's wised up over the years, man. I mean, he's been around longer than any of us. Probably knows the scripture better than any of us. Yeah. Um, so when he, when, when he, you know, his tactics are different now. Yeah, you know, so we have to be wise to those and 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 pay attention to the details. Pay attention to detail, man. I think a lot of Christians would go a lot further in life if they just paid attention to detail. Absolutely. And I think you make a, a, another great point. It's just that uh, well, when I went through seminary, I could, I could see that 
throughout my whole class, it was always like former doctors, former lawyers, former accountants, former yeah. teachers. It was all of that because all of them, I'm not going to say that these skill sets aren't relevant. They're still relevant. But uh, a lot of people are um, trying to run away from the calling. Mm-hmm. They're, they're attempting to run away from the calling, and then a few years later, they understand that, man, I have all the money in the world. I have all of this. I have all the accolades that people expect. But this isn't even what God told me to do. I, and I'm not satisfied personally. Yeah, right? So, so you, you can have the greatest brain in the world to do whatever it is that your heart desires. Mm-hmm. But but it isn't supposed to be used for that purpose. Maybe it's supposed to be used, be used for another purpose. Yeah, man. And, and honestly, man, we're born with intelligence. You know, yeah. we're born we're born to be able to complete and tackle tasks. You know, it's our God given right uh, to have mm-hmm. ideas and to pursue those ideas and see and see them to fruition. But uh, it's 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 extremely important that when we grasp or when we look at what it is that we want to pursue, we make sure that it's in line with what God has called us to do. Because, you know, it's, it's, and it's great to have uh, multiple talents. You know, I, I, I yeah. can go back to the scripture in the book of Mark, I believe, where, you know, they're talking about the parable of, you know, what Jesus pretty much gave, or I'm sorry, the master gave each servant a certain uh, amount of coin, yeah. you know, to signify different talents that we can all have. So, you know, yeah, it's yeah. okay to definitely pick up different talents, but make sure that at the end of the day, you're focusing on what it is that God has called you to do primarily, and those other things are secondary, and can most of the time become help aids as yes. far as helping you accomplish the main mission that God has given you. Exactly. So we can conclude here that service, is the, the definitive term of service, it needs to be a helpful activity to the other person. Um, mm-hmm. We can look at the second definition. It's supplying, um, it's a supplying utilities, water, electricity. So we can say that it probably should be something that they need, not just right. something that they want. Right. So right. the second definition is based on needs. The third definition it says providing or or a provider of accommodation for maintenance or repair. So I can say with this standpoint, you should be able to maintain the relationship. You should be ma- mm. able to to build up the relationship or re- repair the relationship with your service. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, man. That's 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 well said. That is well said. All right. So good thing I'm recording this so I can go back to it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, me too, definitely, definitely. So, so um, I, I'm going to say that there's, it, there's different pieces of Scripture that I believe that will call to service. So mm-hmm. the first one that I looked at is Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, and it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So I'm trying to infuse love and service in Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 actually calls on that. It says, you're called to freedom. So when we, it talks about freedom, it's saying you have free will to do whatever the heck you want to do. Yep. Right? <laughs> and it says here, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So although you have your freedom, please, the Lord is saying, please just use it for something that is good, not just to please yourself. Right, that that is what the flesh is, but through love, serve one another. So we can see here in Galatians chapter five verse thirteen that it's saying to serve one another. So these are commands, but specifically do it through love. Right. And part of the, part of the issue here is that we all have a different view of what love is. <laughs> that, well said. That that that's the component here, and hopefully through the end of this presentation, we'll have a better view of love. Right. I'm going to go on to uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to uh, 20, and that is, that is called uh, the Great Commission. It's, it's exerting the Great Commission. So I'm going to go through uh, some special bolded words here. So it says, um, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. So this is after he um, risen from the dead. Mm-hmm. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And I, I think what's amazing from this is that although they physically seen him, they still doubted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we can say through our lives, although there's all these great things happening, that if we have doubt, we should question if it's even love. Mm. Right? How can mm. we say that we love the Lord God? We're like, please do this, please do this. He keeps on doing whatever we say that we want to do and in, in order to believe in him. And he's standing right in front of us. 
And we, we've seen him uh, die on the cross, and we're still doubting. So how many mm-hmm. times that, that the Lord is illustrating to us his power, he's saving us from different situations, and we're still doubting. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. 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 And it says here, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. So I bolded the word go because it's an action verb. So go, therefore, and make. That's another action verb you have to make. Disciples of all nations. So what it's saying here is our job on earth is to create new disciples. And the, mm. problem, that, the problem that I have with organizations, especially church organizations, is that um, – we're not creating new disciples. What we're doing is inviting the same people who already know Jesus to church. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, you know, if I can interject on that particular point, yeah. because it's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's true. You know, the, the problem is that we've lost a key factor to the ingredient or to the, the, the key factor to the, uh, to the recipe as far as what it takes to make a disciple. You know, a key ingredient is now missing from the recipe. And what that ingredient is, is going outside of the walls with what we've learned. Uh, we focus so much internally, you know, making sure that, you know, our brothers and sisters within the church, you know, have food to eat and that they're spiritually healthy and that they're financially stable and, you know, that yeah. their, their relationships are doing well. But we fail to realize that after we've then formed them inside of the church, uh, the final uh, ingredient to, 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 to complete the task that God has called us all to do is, is to now go out and, and preach yeah. and minister and, and reach other people. You know, I, I'll even um, quickly dive into the subject of, uh, you know, the Molly Music album. I don't know if you've heard his new album. Oh, no, um, no. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a different type of album. He, he's definitely trying to approach a more secular market. Uh, yeah. And I think that I personally think that, that, that that's great. I think that's yeah. great because, you know, what's the point of making another album for Christians what's yeah. an, or, like, for people that already know God, you know? Um, our yeah. job is done in that regard. You already know God. That's great. Now, I need to now reach out to people outside the church that don't know God. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I'm sorry, yeah. man. A little tension there. I apologize. No, it's, it's true. <laughs> I mean, well, the, the, the whole point of Christianity is to, um, is to get other people. And, and I'm going to say, if you're a salesman, Mm-hmm. What point of it is to make all this money and keep on recruiting people and have all these pyramid schemes, but yet you've, not, you've never uh, contributed Duplicated one person? Exactly. Ne- ne- never, never enhance um, God's work by, by uh, bringing at least one person to Christ. Our whole job here is to bring at least one person to Christ. Not, a, not at least one. It should be more than that. But mm-hmm. we're not doing a good job. I mean, I think I think part of the the type of people that are doing a, uh, probably a better job, I don't think as effective. But Jehovah Witnesses are really going out. Oh yeah, they're, yeah, they're they're really going out. We have people who are Muslim, who who will go out to the prisons, and that's why a lot of a lot of the population um, of people who come out of prison end up being Muslim. Hmm. Well said. Yep. Why? Why? Because they because the, that those type of people are going to uh, the prisons, maybe they're going to the hospitals. The more that we keep on uh, staying in these churches and just having fun by ourselves and, and having like a, a, a piece of exclusion, mm-hmm. the more that Christianity is going to fall. I mean, there, there, there's an influx of people who are becoming Muslim now. Yep. And, and all these other faiths. Yes, now, sir. now, we, now we, even, we even have a faith of Deism. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but there, there's a oh. religion for uh, Beyonce. <laughs> no, that's striking yeah. me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there, there's, there's religion for all that actually what they say is, I, f- I forget the number, but we have thousands of religions. There's religion, there's a new religion made every day. There's more than one religion made every day. Wow. And, and just with that example of deism, just, um, just you can take anybody's name and say, hey, you know what, we're going to start worshiping this person. She's obviously a god because she's done this, and she looks so beautiful, and she's so heavenly. Yeah, and, and, right? and, and, and I mean, it's, it is. It's, and I, I think the problem is the issue, the root of it is, uh, you know, because here in the, in the Scripture we were called to, to serve, uh, mm-hmm. you know, one another through love, uh, yeah. and that's so important. But if we, if we don't first love ourselves, it's very easy yeah. for us to then, in, in a search for love, fall into the traps of the enemy, you know what I mean? And that's what typically yeah. tends to happen. You know, where all these religions and all these things that we do, some of the bad decisions that we make in life, it's not that we don't know 
you know, the, the the right thing to do. It's not that we're not aware of our calling. I mean, we know our calling. We've known our yeah. calling since we were kids. It's that thing that, you know, that we love to do and that we're passionate about that we're either too scared to do or we, we get discouraged about, you know. we So we all know our calling, but yeah. it's it's a lack of love that then leads to fear. You know, we don't love ourselves. You know, so how can we, how can we, it's easy to fall into deism <laughs> or wherever yeah. it's called. Is that the religion? De- yeah, yeah. Deism? Yes. Yeah, deism, right? <laughs> So wow. But 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 with that part of the issue is the these churches their their Sundays well their any type of Bible studies that they normally have. I mean they they often turn into services. Um, yes. You're 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 reading about maybe um, in Genesis when God created the earth and all this other stuff. So one of the reasons why I started this is because um, that isn't the real component that is that is really going to save us. Right, 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 because whether God created the world in seven or eight or six days, sometimes doesn't matter to the person who doesn't even know anything about Christ. Yeah, man, and and and, it, and mm-hmm. the truth of it, too, is that, you know, we've got to remember, uh, when, when Lucifer and a third of the angels in heaven were cast out, they weren't cast out because they couldn't worship or couldn't praise. Yeah. I mean, actually, I would assume that they were probably the best at it. Yeah, you know they're probably the best at it at worshiping and praising. So I mean that 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 goes to show that it's good to do that. You know what I mean? That's a, that's yeah. something that Jesus loves and he's thrilled about. But it's not the main component, man. He wants a yeah. relationship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's not going to save us. Actually, we'll go through a couple verses there where it, it actually illustrates that. Mm-hmm. But uh, we're going to go on to the next verse. It says um, uh, Mark chapter ten verse forty five. It says, "For even the Son of Man came to be ser- to be served." came not to be served, but to serve, mm. and to give his life as a ransom for, any, for many. So I'm, that's a very powerful verse because it's saying that the Lord came here not so we can serve him and worship him. He just came here just to serve us. Exactly. Right? And it says here, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he's going to give his life to many people. He doesn't, these people aren't even born yet. Mm. So he gave his life for us, and he doesn't even know us. So when that's we're right. talking about service, Specifically, you don't have to know the person in order to serve. Mm, that's good. That's good. Right? So, so many people are trying to serve their relatives and all these other people that they know. When the clear meaning of everything is to, well, what, what's the, the best illustration of love is giving love to somebody that you don't even know. Yes, yes. Wow. Amen. That's, that's the best that's illustration. That's powerful. Of yeah. That's powerful. So my next slide is, here is how should it be done? So I picked some several verses here, and it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, it says, let all that you, that you do be done in love. So everything that we do, it doesn't matter what it is, we have to do it in love. Why? Because as Christians, we represent Christ, and sometimes there's people in, in our job situations who may know nothing else, who, who may not even attend church, who may know no one Christian, and we're the only example of what love is, mm. right? So since we're only, the only example of what love is, we have to do everything in love, right? Then yeah, at that, man. At that point, they'll be able to figure out what love is just by our mannerisms. And when we think about a baby, right? Mm-hmm. And how does a baby start to learn different languages? Yeah, by, right? by listening to the, the tones that you make and then trying to form them him or herself, you know? Exactly. So it's by our actions that a baby is able to learn. Mm-hmm. So when, when we speak about the scriptures, there's, there's certain people who are babies. They, they need some milk right now. Mm. And, and we are the milk, right? So if, if the only way that they can learn how to, how to speak, yeah, how, the only way that the baby can learn how to speak is through our interpretations of what language is. Yeah. Then, then, then we, we, we are the main source. So there's certain times in, in our surroundings where we'll be the main source. That's mm-hmm. why everything that we do has to be done in love. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. I, I would say this. I think, I think that a lot of people, actually, it's, I, th- I believe it's true that a lot of people, uh, you know, want to be a great Christian. You know, they go to their jobs and they'll even tell. I mean, I, I could use myself as an example again. I worked at a place and uh, there was a lady and her husband that came to work at the same place. And um, mm-hmm. I found out that they were both ministers. Both the lady and her husband were both pastors of a church. And yeah. I was shocked. Yeah. I was shocked when I found out because the woman's attitude, though, was yeah. not conducive to that of somebody that's operating 
under the regime of Jesus Christ, you know, somebody yeah. that's trying to be or be like Christ. I mean, I think we get so focused on being a Christian. To use your baby example, that's like a mother, a baby crying for milk, and a mother going to the baby while the baby is crying and just continually saying, I'm mother. Yeah. I'm mother. Yeah. Yeah. I'm mother, yeah. you know, but the baby is yeah. left there like, uh, okay, I get the fact that you're my mother, but you should, you, you should be doing something right now to pacify, yeah. or not necessarily pacify, but to help me uh, yeah. alleviate or get through the current situation that I'm going through, which in the yeah. sense of the baby would be hunger. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, so, and, and, and that's why the, the role of a minister is so vast, because if, if you, whatever you do is under a microscope, man, mm. and somebody sees you doing nonsense, all of a sudden, oh, man, I can't, I can't believe in Christ. This is the God that they're serving? Right? Mm. These, these are the type of people that are in church? Right, and and you know it firsthand. I mean, being a um, a son or or a daughter of somebody in ministry is very difficult, man. You're under a microscope, twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, life is definitely different. Yeah. I will say that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll say that for another time. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Right? right. So Matthew chapter six verse twenty four says, "No one can serve two masters," as you alluded to before. So no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Mm-hmm. You cannot serve God and money. And what I take of that as we were referencing with, with relationships is that it's very difficult to have two relationships, right? Wow. So when, you, when you talk about polygamy, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to be a polygamist because, you, as it says here, you have to devote your time to at least one person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, man. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and no matter what you do, you will illustrate in some type of way that you despise the other just from not giving that person the proper amount of time. Wow. Wow. Right? So that, that's just what it is. So essentially, it's hard to serve two people in, in the relationship. I mean, it's even more difficult to say that um, um, uh, you, you, this is an example why we shouldn't uh, allow others to enter in our relationship or mm-hmm. maybe our parents to enter in our relationship, right? Because our, our parents are one master, right? But wow. then, but, but then maybe our, our significant other is another master. Mm-hmm. So the, the mother is constantly butting into this relationship, and because of that parental relationship, you, you have a certain type of reverence for your mom. You're like, oh, man, I got I to gotta listen to my mom. And then your wife is saying, Oh no, you gotta listen to me. So now there's two masters, and you're like, man, I have to go with one. Right? <laughs> you know it's crazy, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's crazy because I've been to so many weddings, right? I'm now yeah. I'm I'm 30 years old. Um, yeah. so I've seen a lot of weddings. I was married at one point myself, uh, but yeah. we'll save that for another time as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, everybody knows. Everybody, see what you're saying? I believe everybody knows it. It's just execution. Uh, yeah. I, you know, almost every wedding that I've ever been to, it, it, you know, the, the minister or the preacher that's presiding over the wedding will always make an address to the loved ones and the, fa- the friends and family and always say something along the lines of, you know, you know, now they're getting mad, now that they're married, you know, uh, um, you know, <laughs> give them time, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just be together, you know, don't, mothers and fathers, you know, leave them alone because now they're together or whatever, you know, and yeah. they'll even, there's even times where they'll even bring up the scripture that talks about a man leaving his, his home. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be with his wife, you know, so Uh we know these things. So let me ask you a question. Why do you think it is that we just don't execute? We don't, we just don't do it. Oh, we just don't do it because um, uh, part of it is um, we're looking upon what society feels. Mm. So so say, say for instance, um, the relationship is maybe going south, right? Or maybe, maybe uh, say, say we're talking about, uh, a family in the ministry. Mm-hmm. So a family in the ministry, they have to up, uphold a certain type of standard, right? Everyone expects that. Right. Maybe they're putting on Facebook, oh, you know what? I went to the Bahamas or I went to Atlantic City or I went to uh, Las Vegas and they start posting things on Facebook. Mm-hmm. The first thing that's going to happen is the parents of those, of those people in, uh, that are connected to ministry is going to call them. And they're going right. to say, why are you doing all that? <laughs> right, it's it's our business, right? Yeah, right. So, definitely. but I think I think too many times we get our emotions just caught up because that is our son, that is our daughter, 
and because of the the view that everyone else will have, especially when you talk about the Haitian community. I've I've been to weddings of the Haitian community, and sometimes if you put on like um, reggae music or maybe like a first dance type of music, people will leave, man. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah people will leave, man. Definitely. I mean, every everyone has a different view of dancing, but I don't think it's it's a sin to dance with your wife or dance with your husband. Oh, okay, no, I think... No, no, no one's saying to go bump and glide in front of everyone on the dance floor, mm-hmm. right? But I think that's a clear example that uh, a lot of these Haitian parents, especially because that's what I know, is that they try to infuse their judgment on how a marriage should be. Mm. And, and, and when I think about just how Haitians normally treat people in the church, you can be 30, 35 years old, you can be married, and they still call you part of the youth, mm-hmm. right? So no matter what, no matter if you're married, no matter if you've been in this church for 30 years, you can, be, you can have your role, you can be making money, you can be any type of um, occupation that you have, you can be out of college. No matter what, you're still, um, you're still uh, viewed as youth in their, in their viewpoint. So because you're still viewed as youth, because you're still viewed as a little kid, I still have a, a decision-making authority on your relationship. Why? Because I've been married 30 years. I've been married 25 mm-hmm. years. I'm 60 years old. I'm 50 years old. Well, technically, because you've already been married, I'm never going to surpass the amount of years that you've been married because obviously I'm younger than you, and I'm never going to be older than you as long as you're living. So, <laughs> so technically, you'll always have authority over me. Right. Right, right. So you'll always feel like you'll have a certain type of wisdom over me because of your experiences, but maybe the type of um, thought process that you have is old. Mm. Well, honestly, to be honest with you, it's not necessarily old, man. It's forgotten, yeah. I yeah. believe. Because you, you, you even look at Jesus Christ. I mean, he started his, his ministry at a very, very young age. You yeah. know, uh, I believe there's a story in Scripture that talks about how his parents lost him. You yeah. know, uh, Mary thought he was with Joseph. Joseph thought he was, he was with Mary, and nobody knew where the little Jesus was. And yeah. come to find out, he was in the temple teaching the teachers. Yeah. Yep. You know, teaching the teachers, teaching those guys that were there and that were experienced. I think it's 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 a level of arrogance that has come into the world. I think it's a le- it's a lack of humility that has now plagued the world, where people are more afraid of losing position as opposed to getting it right. Yeah. You know, I'd rather I'd rather you know bash you and keep you down as opposed to allow you to give me the knowledge that God has blessed you with. You yeah. know, because I'm scared that if you know, if you actually do know what you portray yourself to know, then I'll lose my position at the church. You yeah. know, I may have to retire, <laughs> I don't, and I don't and I don't know what I'll do with my life if I retire yeah. because again, my ministry is tied within the four walls. So you yeah. know, because I was never taught how to evangelize or how to really show love. If, mm-hmm. if you're just as good at doing something that I'm at, uh, that I'm doing, uh, it causes yeah. me now to be irrelevant. And, and you, you also make a good point of Jesus serving when he was a child. Mm. Yeah. So he, he understood that his life is not, is not his own. And when we talked about stewardship last week, that's what we're mainly referring to, is that your life is not your own. You can't say, I'm going to live my life. There's no such thing in Christianity as your life. <laughs> you're, 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 you just happen to manage a life that God gave you. Ooh, that's life. good. That's good right, right. there. Say that right. one more time. Say that one yeah, more time. You, you just happen to manage a life that God gave you. Wow. That's it, man. That's good stuff. So, now let's go on to the next verse here. It says, in Luke chapter 14, verses uh, 12 to 14, it states, He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest you also invite you in, your, in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, mm. the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because mm. they cannot repay you. Wow. For you will be paid at the resurrection of the just. And when we think about that, you have so many cliques in so many different societies, right? Mm-hmm. You, you go inside of a church and you, you know, uh, maybe they want to have this pastor because if I allow this pastor to say something, then he'll invite me to his church. Mm. Right? So you're, you're doing things sometimes to get repaid. It, right. it, it, it seems like a corporate setting. But the Lord is saying that the best thing that you can do is give it to somebody who you know can never repay you because you're willing to give it up. You're willing to serve that much that you don't even care if you get repaid. You're like, hey, it's whatever. I'm just giving it to you because the Lord allowed me to have it. 
Yeah, uh, I mean that 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 goes into also. Uh, I know that the scripture, the scripture talks about uh, you know uh, ministers being provided for by the church, right? Yeah. Uh, but I don't I don't ever really re- remember reading a scripture where it says that the minister is supposed to ask the church yeah. for the yeah. amount. Because I think when you do that, you know, asking for an honorarium or saying that you have to pay me this X and X amount of dollars to to yeah. come to your church, uh, what you're then doing is now hindering that church from receiving their blessing. Even though yeah. they're paying you and they're being obedient to God because they're, pay, they're paying you the amount that you asked for, uh, uh, yeah. you're hindering their blessing. You're hindering yeah. their blessing. And it's not necessarily what God asked for. It's up to the church or it's up to the group of people to, yeah. to, 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 to view you, and God will provide. God will send the word and say, okay, send this, send that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, I mean, but people are just trying to, trying to pimp the church, man. That's just what <laughs> it is. <laughs> and, and that's why people have no faith in it, because people wow. are pimps. Right. Yep. So, so as it says here, as we're alluding to with just churches in general, stop, stop feeding all the people. Stop feeding your brothers. Stop feeding your friends. Stop feeding your relatives. Stop mm. feeding all the people that you know. When are you going to go out and invite the poor, the people mm. who are crippled, the people who are lame, the people that are blind? When we sit here and around Christmas time, Thanksgiving, we're sitting around our families, and that's a great time to fellowship. But what about all the other people? That would be an even powerful movement if we invited somebody who isn't even our family, our immediate family. Yeah, you, you know, God is, God is saying, I believe that God is saying, you know, instead of worrying about and continually praying for me to heal your brother, why don't yeah. you go out of this house and go heal yeah. that blind person that you know is down the street? You know, exactly. and I can guarantee you that if you do that, if you go and do that act of faith, you, you, you take of yourself to give to another. It's a sacrifice. Uh, yes. You know, there's no greater love that one should sacrifice his life for another, right? You're sacrificing yes. now. You're going out. Yes. I can yes. I can guarantee you that by the time you came home, something would shift in your home, you yes. know, because because you are now you are now receiving a blessing from God for what you did. So you carry that blessing with you, you yes. know. <laughs> Absolutely. So it, it, it's possible that you may not even have to to mention your brother's situation again, because you know we fail to realize God knows everything that we pray for, man. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I don't think that God is looking necessarily for a uh, for us to recite um, mm-hmm. a list that he already put together. You know, he put together the list, so we spend too much time reciting the list of issues. Yeah. You know, God healed my brother, got that. No, no, no. He knows that already. You know, he, yeah. he, he, he's more interested in hearing something like, you know, God, give me the strength, you know, to yeah. fight my fear of talking to people so I can go out and, 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 and minister. <laughs> you know, God, give me more income or whatever, or God, yeah. uh, show me how to manage my money so I can go and feed the poor this Sunday. You know, yeah. come on. Yeah. Well, um, people are probably going to hang up the phone, so you, you might as well not talk about evangelism. People don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're right, man. You're yeah, so because, right, man. Yeah, that's the scary part. I mean, I think plenty of people have come up to me and said, how do I get over my fear of speaking to people or speaking in front of people? Cause I, I just have to have a fear of the Lord so much that I'm like, yo, if I don't do this, then something is going to have bad happen to me or – I'm, I'm going to feel like I'm not doing the Lord's work. So any fear that you have, there's no fear in love. And as mm. it states here in Psalm chapter 2, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And when we connect that to uh, the marital relationships that we were referring to before, is that when we serve our partner, we're going to serve them with a certain type of fear because we have to fear, have a certain type of fear of losing them. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's that's probably also why it's you know marriages are done in you know typically in from the beginning of time typically in front of a group of people and you make it a declaration yeah. in front of a group of people you know because yeah. it's just, there's supposed to be a certain level of fear there that if you if you you know would to break this this bond or if you were the result of why this bond was broken you know yeah. there should be a certain level of ridicule there and it's okay yeah you know because you 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 made this uh you know public declaration and then you you broke that bond. I mean the good thing about Jesus Christ is that he forgives and you know he's merciful and all that, but we can't forget that you know despite uh what we would want i mean if we sin or if we break mm-hmm. a, a a vow, we're going to get punished for that yeah. you know it's similar to the father that you know will will punish or discipline yeah. their child and then give them a hug and take them for ice cream ten minutes later. you yeah. know <laughs> you still get disciplined when you do something wrong absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right, so we we should serve. We basically serve with fear. Serve as if our life depended on it. Right, right. And and it, as it says in Proverbs chapter thirteen, verse twenty-two, 
A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So what I took out of this is when you serve, there should be something left over that that they, they feel like they remember you. Mm. So that's, the, that's what an inheritance is, right? It's something that can keep on going and going and going, right? Right. So, so whenever you serve somebody, it should be like, wow, this is the best I ever had. Right? I, I've never felt that type of hospitality from anyone. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of nurses. I'm sure there's a lot of social workers or caseworkers in different fields that mm-hmm. should, should be able to serve in a type of way that every time that they leave this person, the person feels like they've just been left with an inheritance mm-hmm. because they're, they're, they're going to be they're going to be able to remember exactly what that person did for them because they did it in such a loving way. So, so Professor Eli, are you yes, saying yes. then? Are you saying then yes. that? That uh, inheritance doesn't necessarily equate to money. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. wow. I mean, wow. That's yeah. a revelation. <laughs> that is a revelation. Yeah. So it's not about how much money you necessarily leave behind. Yes. You know, it's, it's more about the legacy. It's what people will remember you by. It's, it's, it's if somebody will carry on and continue doing what exactly. you did. It's, it's if somebody will say, God, give me a double portion you yes. know, of, what, of what, you know, he had so that way exactly. I can do even greater works for the kingdom. Yeah, because mm. when, you, when you think about it, too, this inheritance, if we were to, say, just leave it as monetary terms, it has a certain limit, and it will be done. Mm-hmm. Right? Wow. So, yeah. so when, once, once it's past that limit, then there's no, um, there's more, there's no more legacy because it's finished. Mm. Right? So when, well, you say that it, and it, when you leave an inheritance, you're more leaving a legacy of hard work as opposed to a legacy of, you know, I could have left you a billion dollars, but I should be more, more so leaving a legacy of, the work that it took to get that money, exactly. not necessarily the money itself. Actually, when, when you think about um, Warren Buffett, and I heard his children were uh, were very um, were very angry with him because he's not leaving him all his billions of dollars. Wow. Most of his billions of dollars are going to charities. Wow. His cho- his children, um, he he allowed his children to to just get a piece, not in the billions, you know, like uh like a couple million dollars, I think like a million or two million dollars, and he's like, hey, here's, here's the money, and go make something of it. So mm. a, a person who's a billionaire, and you only give your, your kids just a couple of million, not even like a hundred million or anything, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. because he was trying to instill a certain type of work ethic. Wow. Right? So I know they're angry, but he, uh, Warren Buffett understands that money is just going to pass away. He, he understands the, the service that he's able to do with money. Mm. Right? Mm. So we can look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So as it states here, um, you can do everything for everyone else, but if you deny their own people in your household, then really, how are you illustrating what faith actually is? Mm, that makes right. me think about. That makes mm-hmm. me think about, like, uh, you know, we were talking about being a pastor's kid, and I'll briefly yeah. touch into that. You know, that a lot yeah. of ministers, you're so focused on the church that you're forgetting that your first ministry is in your house. And I know that's cliche. You've probably heard that yeah. before. You know, mm-hmm. that is the theme that ministers are talking about now, especially when they mention you know, yeah. pastors' children and ministers' children. But I, I feel that still there's a big issue in that regard, that that's still, for some reason, not being something that's uh, looked at as important. You know, your first yeah. ministry, uh, you know, should be within your own household, you know. And, that's, yeah. and, and, it, and I think that Jesus or God, you know, when he developed that idea, uh, he, that idea of it starting in your household, he did that on purpose because he knows that man needs a help aid, you know, which is why yeah. he created Eve to begin with. And if you can yeah. get... If you can get your wife and your kid to all buy into your vision, I mean, not yeah. only you're not the only one now uh, pursuing yeah. the things of God or trying to build the ministry. It's now a family thing, you know. Yeah. And there's strength in numbers, you know, where two or three are gathered. I mean, I can go yeah. into a whole bunch of different scriptures that that would yeah. validate that. So, yeah. you know, why is that? So let me ask you this: Why do you feel like there's a lack as far as that particular aspect of it, as well, far as you know, ministering to family? Well, I think part of it too is that. Um, uh, the ministers they they start having these these other conversations that they don't they don't uh, they don't privy that information to their family. Maybe they have a maybe they have a conversation with another pastor and another pastor is like, hey, you should really do this, you should really do this. And maybe that pastor has a lot more experience. So then 
you start going head on with this type of experience and then you forget, oh, wait, I didn't even include my wife. I didn't even have this conversation. Why? Mm. Because it, as, as we can see, things with social media, things go so quickly, right? I mean, people can find out information in a second now, right? Right. So, so as soon as you find out that information of maybe a task that you want to complete, um, I think people just get so honed in, like, oh, man, I want to do this, I want to do this. And you think that maybe explaining the whole thing to your family is going to take too much time, mm. right? And wow. and as a as a leader, maybe maybe you don't want to sacrifice that time, or maybe uh, you want to feel like this is all you. Some people are very egotistical, and um, they they want that type of power, right? Oh right. man, wait, who did this? Oh man, it was the pastor who did it. Wow, may, maybe his wife can help him out one day. Maybe his kids can help him out one day. So now we start glorifying these pastors because they did something when technically they shouldn't have done it by themselves. Mm. It, it, it should have been with everyone. Yeah. Right. So, so the perfect, the, not the perfect, but the great pastor is going to be a servant leader as Jesus and be able to inspire and encourage everyone to do exactly what he feels like they should be doing. Yeah. And, I mean, we, and we also have to realize too, that, uh, uh, you know, um, Jesus's parents and his brother rolled with him. Yeah. You know, they they rolled with him, you know. Yeah. It was a team effort. Uh, you yeah. know, we, we can't lose sight of that because, you know, uh, when, you, when you have a son that's doing things and calling himself the chosen one pretty much, you know, yeah. in, in today's society if that would have happened, a lot of people would have chastised the entire family because they would have thought they had a nut job for a son. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have this yeah. nut job as your son, so but the whole family – you know, I would have had to support him. It's tough if you're on your own and you have these visions of, from God of what he wants mm-hmm. you to do. And, and you know, they're, 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 they're crazy. Yeah, because God is not a small God, so why would he want us to dream small? You know, some yeah. of the things that he's called you to do are going to be huge. And they're going to yeah. be things that, you know, if looked at from the naked eye seem impossible. But if you can really zone in and look at the fact that you have uh, a God that dwells inside of you through the Holy Spirit and also dwells inside of your wife and your kids, you know, yeah. the four of you coming together now, you know, uh, that, 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 task, how, that task, however large it may have been, uh, seems yeah. a lot smaller now. Yeah. Absolutely, man. You're absolutely right. You made a lot of great points there. Right. So the, the, I guess the conclusion is we need other people. We can't do things alone. Yeah, definitely. Right. So there's going to be strength in numbers with um, everyone serving towards a certain goal. I mean, it's mm. just like a team, right? Yeah, you can't exactly. just you can't just have one superstar. You can't you can't go to Cleveland and only have LeBron James and think that they're gonna win the championship. Yeah, that's why they're trying to bring in Kevin Love right now. Yeah, right, exactly, right. <laughs> right. So we have Titus chapter three, verse two. I know a lot of people don't read Titus, but that is a book in the Bible. It's <laughs> Short book. Here, yeah. To speak evil of no one. So when you talk about serving people, this is the way that you should speak to them. You shouldn't speak evil of no one. To mm-hmm. avoid quarreling, which is kind of like disagreements and arguments, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy to all people. It doesn't say to some people. It says showing courtesy to all people, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go on to the next one. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 35. And he sat down and called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. So kind of saying that although you're the leader, although you're the top dog of this organization, the CEO, you have to be willing to be last. And when we talk about, I remember um, uh, a captain got in trouble on a ship, mm. right? Because what he did was instead of – part of, the, part of the, uh, the mantra of the ship captain is that he can't get off board until everyone get is is saved on a boat or something. Mm, okay. Right? Okay. So the ship was like going down, or there was a problem with exactly. the ship. Exactly. The ship was okay. going down, and he was one of the first people to leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> While all those families are just sitting there on a the boat. Right? Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, you know his wife probably had dinner waiting. You know, yeah. people coming. He couldn't be late. You know. <laughs> right. I, I, have, I haven't kept up with that story, but I know there's some jail time and fines for that. Because oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's natural order. As it says here, if anyone would be first, which is a leader, he must be last of all and servant of all. So if he was supposed to go last, so being a, a leader means that sometimes, sometimes you have to be last. I think another example when we speak about relationships, that's why 
we say to ourselves, you're going to open the door for the female, mm. right? Because you're yeah. going to go after her. You're going to be last. Yeah, I'll even go into the fact, uh, a secular song that I remember from uh, from my youth. It was a yeah. song by an a, a artist named Jaheem. Uh, yeah. And one of the lines uh, of the song, and I believe it was the title, was Put That Woman First. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and the, the whole basis of the song was, was telling, you know, a man that's in the act of pursuing or courting somebody, or courting a woman, I should say, that when you look, yeah. at, when you look at that, uh, if you put her first, these are the X and X and X and X and X and X and X results that you were going to get, that you're going to yeah. get as a yeah. result of doing that, you know, and I, I, I never, I'll never forget that song. It ministers to yeah. me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because so as long as you uh, serve the people, as long as you take care of your people, more than likely they're going to take care of you. Yeah. That, that, that's just what it is. And that's why we should illustrate love no matter where we are, no matter what we do, because hopefully somebody is going to catch on to that. Right. Okay. As it says here in John thirteen sixteen, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, mm. nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So well, basically we can say the same thing just in a relationship no one is greater than the other person. We just have different roles. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it doesn't matter who gets the credit, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's making the money. Mm, wow. Right? Wow, it, it, that's, that's a topic right there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter. Because ultimately, we're filling out the same tax return, right? Mm. We're, we're, we're paying the same bills. We live in the same house. We're sleeping in the same bed. Who cares whose money it is? Wow. Wow, right? so, we've got to focus so, on ministry, right, because it's not about exactly. the money. Exactly. So we, we all have our different roles in every household. So mm. we're not greater. One is not greater than, than another. We just have different roles within this relationship. Okay. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Right? Wow. So as it's stating here, uh, you have you have everything in your possession. You have everything in the world, but you see somebody in need, but you don't help them out. Mm-hmm. So how do, how does God's love abide in you if you see somebody in need and you don't help them? Yeah, it, it, it's I think an example too, just as musicians, where you go inside of a church and you say, you know what? Oh, I've seen this many of times with like Christian concerts and stuff like that, mm-hmm. where they say, I'm not going to go on stage unless you pay me. <laughs> I need a deposit first. Yes, I need you know. a deposit first. Right. Right? So you're kind of already taken care of, and you see your brother in need. You know they need, they, they have a show to, to perform, and you close your heart against them, although you know that all you have to do is just go on off stage. As if they planned on not being able to pay you, too. Exactly. You know? As if that was their plan. I'm, I, I knew you were coming. I knew we yeah. agreed that I was going to pay you a certain amount of money. I'm just coming to you right now. Uh, because I just don't want to pay you, and I'm yeah. going to give you this excuse, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Or, yeah. or, or we see somebody who's crossing the street, and um, we don't try to help them out. Maybe it's somebody who's disabled or crippled or something. We just don't help them out. We see somebody in online who's struggling um, in the supermarket who maybe doesn't have enough money. Mm-hmm. And we have our and we have enough money on our debit card, and we're just like waiting. We're like, oh, please, can can this person hurry up? Meanwhile, maybe we could have just paid for a, a small token, and that could have illustrated a certain type of love that they're so enthused about who what God you serve that they start attempting to understand the God you serve too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. For so sure. The, 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 through through your love and uh, through your illustration of love and service, you can bring others to Christ. So you don't really have to keep on talking about Christ and evangelize for somebody to come to him. It's going to be those little subtle hints of who he is. I forgot who it was. Uh, I was uh, it was a quote, and I've heard it several times, but it said, uh, it was, uh, I think, St. Thomas Aquinas or something like that. Some mm-hmm. uh, Somebody said something along the lines of uh, uh, preach the gospel and, mm-hmm. it, and if necessary, use words. Yeah, wow. wow preach that's the powerful. gospel and if necessary, use <laughs> words. Right, so the the gospel is your life, man. Yeah, yep, okay, yep, so it's definitely. We're running out of time here, but I'm 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 okay with going a little bit over. Right, so um, we have here. I'm looking at Jesus praising Gethsemane and Mark chapter 14, 
verses 32 to 42, Mm -hmm. right? And I just want to go over a little bit out of this, right? So when we talk about service, I I really want to point this out because God, although he died for our sins, we have to understand if he really wanted to die for our sins, Mm. right? So Jesus prays in Gethsemane. It says in, in verse 32, and I'm putting it a little bit bigger here so we can all see. Awesome. So it says, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So he's praying. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to, great, and, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Mm. So here it is. Jesus already knows who he is and what he has to do, but he's, a, he's still distressed and troubled, mm-hmm. right? So that, that doesn't take away from us feeling like we're distressed and troubled through the service that we have to do for the Lord. Wow. Wow. Right? So, wow. Yeah, so although you don't want to do it, Jesus didn't want to die on the cross right then and there, although he knew the effects of dying on the cross. He was distressed and troubled, but yet he still did it. Mm-hmm. So although there's a certain situation in church or a certain situation at work and you don't feel like doing it, you don't feel like working things out with your loved one, you don't feel like um, uh, working things out with uh, your husband or wife and you would rather just get divorced, well, the relationship doesn't mean that you're not going to be troubled and distressed. Even Jesus was distressed and troubled, right? So nothing is going to be perfect. Although Mm. Jesus is perfect, he had those imperfect situations that he didn't like because he was partly human. So although, let me, I, I had to repeat yeah. that. You said although Jesus is perfect, yes. he had those imperfect situations yes. in life because Absolutely. he's human. Exactly. <laughs> wow. That's something exactly. to write down. That's something to write yes. down. That is that. Wow. Well, hopefully I'll put this on YouTube and keep on going back to it. Yeah, <laughs> man. Right. So in verse 34, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful. So Jesus was feeling sorrow. So this is the human aspect of Jesus. He felt distressed. He felt troubled. And now his soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Mm. So he's feeling sorrow because he really doesn't want to do this. So there's certain parts. I I know um, even with you, Brother Carl, um, maybe you don't want to go to school. Maybe you don't want to study. (laughs) Maybe, Maybe it's distress and trouble for you to study. Oh, yeah, maybe, you're, maybe you're feeling sorrowful because of all the loans and all this other stuff that you got to pay, but guess what? It's not about you. Wow. It's about the service. Even Jesus didn't really want to <laughs> really die for our sins, but he understood the task at hand. It says mm-hmm. here, um, remain here and watch. So he's, he's telling that to his apostles. And going a little farther, he fell, he fell on the ground and prayed. So he went in solitude. He fell down on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. So mm-hmm. he was praying that this, this thing doesn't even happen, that he doesn't even go on the cross. That's what his prayers were. He already knew that he had to go on the cross. He already knew his, his total reason for being on here on earth. But he was praying that it may not even happen. Mm. Mm. He didn't even want to do it. And verse 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. So he's already recognizing that, Lord Jesus, oh, God, my Father, you can do anything in the world. Okay. I know this is possible for you, right? So please, and he says, remove this cup from me, kind of saying, remove this desire that I have from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. So it's all about your will. I know this has to come to pass, and it's all about your will, but, Lord, I really don't want to do this. Yeah, or do it a different way, God. Exactly. Exactly. When, <laughs> when, you, when you say do it a different way, you can think about Abraham killing his son, right? He was mm. waiting for, for God to give him a different way, and God gave him that different way. He gave him the sheep. That's right. The lamb in right? the bush. That's right. Yes. Right, okay. So it says here, and he came and found them sleeping. So he's re- referencing the disciples. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit mm-hmm. indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all know our flesh is weak. Yeah. Verse, verse 39, and he went away and prayed, saying the same words. So although he already said it, 
she went back and said the same exact words over again. Right? Wow. So some, sometimes we feel like, Lord, are you even hearing me? Even Jesus was repeating the same words. Wow. Right? So even Jesus was distressed and troubled and sorrowful. And he went back repeatedly and said the same words and said, hey, Lord, uh, hey, God, please take this away from me. I don't want to go through this. Verse 40, um, and again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said, are you still sleeping and, and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. So he already knew the hour has come. So he could ready to tell his future. Not only that, it said that in verse 41, and he came to them a third time. So if they, mm. he came to them a third time, that means that he was, going, he was praying and coming back, praying and coming back, praying and coming back. He already knew his fate. Although yeah. he already knew his fate, he still was trying to get out of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something else that I grab out of here, too, I'll, I'll try to be very quick with this point, is that yeah. uh, simply put, uh, when God has called you to do something and you don't understand or you don't want to do it, uh, even your closest friends, uh, maybe your prayer circle, uh, won't be there for you. Yes. Because oh, God, yes. <laughs> even oh. your closest friends, even your wow. prayer circle will not be there for you because God just wants you to understand that even though you don't hear my voice, I'm still here. And what I said a year ago or what I said two years ago or three years ago, where Jesus, when I sent you down 30 years ago yeah. uh, before this moment, I told you that this is what's going to happen, and you already knew the plan. You know, we're yeah. sticking to the plan. Yeah. We're sticking to the plan. I, I'm, it's not that I'm not answering you. It's not that I don't yeah. hear you. But I'm not going to repeat myself twice because I'm God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? It, then, then we can also assume that um, not everyone else is going to understand God's plan for your life. Mm. Nor are they right. even gonna. Nor uh, are they even gonna care. Right. They're, exactly. They're, 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 they're gonna think you're some type of crazy guy. Well, why are you praying so much, buddy? I mean, why are you going back and forth praying about the same thing? You know, don't, don't you already understand that whatever is gonna be is gonna be? But Jesus, Jesus' faith was more than what we could ever imagine. He knows right. that his father t- can do anything, and he's just asking his father, please, just let me extend my time just a little bit more just so I can have more workings within this land. But even so, God already understood that his little three years of ministry between the, the times of 30 to, to about 33 was that that was enough to carry on to over 2,000 years later and we're still speaking about him. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. So Jesus didn't have to live to 60 years old for us to remember him. His, <laughs> his, his young age at 33, he was able to accomplish so much that we're still able to remember him. And that's what we need to take out of life, too, is that through our little amounts of time that we have here on earth, we can make uh, a legacy. We can have that standpoint on somebody's life that they'll never forget what we did for them. And you can start tonight. And you can yeah. start that legacy tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. so we're going to go on to this next verse. Um, uh, we're going to wrap up soon here. I just wanted to illustrate that on the Sabbath, even when um, it was on the Sabbath in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, 8 through 11, it says on the, on the bottom sentence, the last sentence, uh, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So just saying that the Lord uh, created everything in six days and he wanted you to rest on the Sabbath, right? Mm-hmm. I want to make out a point here, is that Jesus was chastised for uh, doing miracles on the Sabbath. In John chapter 7, verse 22 to 24, um, I'll just read it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So kind of saying, although this was the Sabbath, you're supposed to do good works all the time. And, <laughs> exactly. and what, I, what I take from this is that you have several people that they, they may be a servant of some sort, and they may say, you know what, but it's not Sunday. Oh, you know what, but it's not Thursday. Oh, you know what, I'm not getting paid for this. Well, it kind of doesn't matter if you're getting paid because Jesus, God worked from, from, um, uh, for six straight days, and he rested on the seventh. He didn't say, you know what, it's... It's, 
it, it's um, I can't do something on the seventh day just because, you know what, this is my rest day. So our example here is of Jesus where he was still performing miracles no matter what day it was. It would work for him. Yeah, but and rest, it, and, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you can go ahead. No, I was going to say rest, uh, you know, he, 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 the, the, the scripture is focused on the creation, on creation. So he created in six days and he rested. It doesn't say that he stopped doing everything that he was doing. It said that he rested from that particular thing, you yes. know. Like he didn't say, he didn't say that he stopped being God because, yeah. I mean, I believe that God has more uh, going on than this little bitty planet that we call Earth, you know, yeah. and, uh, and uh, us being with these little specks of dust that reside on this planet. You know, it, it probably was like God, I could equivalent it maybe to, to God, it could have been like playing a guitar or like practicing for an hour, you know. So he yeah. practiced every day for six days for an hour. And then the yeah. seventh day, he said, you know what, I'm not going to practice guitar today. Uh, but he probably still was functioning. You know, I wouldn't say probably, he still functioned. He was still yeah. God. <laughs> you yeah, know? and, and uh, what I like to say about that with that example is if, if God left us, then technically we would die because the, the world wouldn't be able to rotate on its own. Mm. The, the mm. only reason why things are still moving on uh, throughout seven straight days is because of God. If, yeah. if God said on the seventh day I'm really going to rest and just chill and do nothing, then all of us would die because we're yeah. nothing without him. Right? So right. Uh, that, that doesn't make any as well as if we were to put it in the context of this earth, then maybe six straight days, maybe things would go well for us. Then maybe on the seventh day, every seventh day there should be disasters all over the world then. Mm. Why? Because God isn't there. Yeah, he's sleeping today. You yeah. know, I'm not answering any calls. Take, take exactly, messages, right? you know. Yeah, and Gabriel, take these messages for me. It's, it's, yeah. it's the seventh day. Whatever yep. you choose the seventh day to be, I don't like that. And that's an argument, too, that we could probably stay for another time. Whatever you choose yeah. your seventh day as, you know. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think we focus too much on, on the, uh, what, what, what do I want to say, the context and not the content. Yeah, we yeah. focus too much on the context and not yeah. the content. Yeah, uh, exactly. Then you have a lot of people, uh, whether they be, um, they practice Judaism or uh, Seventh-day Adventists, you know, just everyone has a different view, but the, the clear view, it, it doesn't matter. The, the, the concept is uh, work for six days, rest on the seventh, no matter what That's you it. call the seventh. Okay? <laughs> exactly. If, if, the, if the seventh is Wednesday, whoop de doo All right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right? So uh, I, I just put, Jesus performed seven miracles on the Sabbath, and I just highlighted what he did. And the first one, it says he delivered a man from the demon possession. And then the other ones, it says that he healed or restored. So there's other things that he was doing on the Sabbath. So he mm. didn't start, stop doing the works of God just because of the Sabbath. He just didn't Sabbath. create. He didn't create. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and, and if we call Jesus uh, partly being a carpenter, um, maybe he was a carpenter for six days, but on the seventh day he wasn't a carpenter. Yeah, he was a rabbi on the seventh day, maybe. Right. So, so, <laughs> so, so maybe the things that we're actually doing for money maybe should be done those six days. On the seventh day, we should chill out. It shouldn't just be anything just dealing with money. Just, or, just uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, or, or maybe, or maybe we're out ministering for those six days, but on that seventh yeah. day, we're, we're eating, we're receiving. It's our, day, it's our day to edify and receive for ourselves. So that way, because you know, it's like a car. You know, if it yeah. has no gas, it can't run, right? So yeah. you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe after you drive a while, you go and you fill up again, you know, so yeah. that way you can drive some more. So maybe that's what the seventh day was. Maybe it was like a, a recharge. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, he's, he's giving us an exact illustration of why we should recharge, mm. right? Because if we're saying, if even God says, well, let's please have a day for, for ourselves, then we have to do it. It just makes sense. Right? So That's the right. next point, the next points I want to make is uh, definitely serving with love. So there, there's only just a few concepts here. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13, everyone likes to talk about what is love, right? So it says here, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a nosy gong or a clanging cymbal. So it's saying here, you can do all that you can in order to illustrate love. Right, or try to illustrate that um, that uh, that you actually love something. So you can have all these actions, but if you if 
if if you don't have love within it, if you're not serving with love within it, it's just noisy. It's just something for fluff. Mm. And, and the second part, it says, even if you have prophetic powers, so God can give you all these powers to serve, and you can even have all the wisdom in the world. You can have, you can understand all the mysteries, and have all the faith, and you can have all the faith to remove mountains. But if you don't have love, you have nothing. Amen. And if you give all that you have, and you can deliver your body to be burned, so that can be part of like uh, being martyred, right? So back in those times, um, uh, back in biblical times, Jesus' time, people wanted to be martyred on purpose. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Yeah. That is so true. People wanted to be martyred on purpose because they wanted to leave a legacy. So they, they were purposely attempting to be martyred so you can say, you know what? This person, they died for Christ. And this person should definitely be in heaven and your name is going to be plastered everywhere. Why? Because you were martyred. You died for Christ. So what it's specifically stating here is you can give away all that you have. You can give um, – uh, Warren Buffett can give away all his millions, all his billions, rather. But if he didn't give it with love, it means absolutely nothing. You can give your offering, and if you didn't give it with love, it means absolutely nothing. Right? Mm-hmm. So you can you deliver your body to be burned, sacrifice your whole body. But have no, not love, and you gain nothing. Why? Because it says here, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things. And when we talk about, well, I'll get to that later. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. And as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we know prophecy in part. But when perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So I'm going to start, stop right there. But at the end, it says, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of love. So you can have all the faith in the world. You can have all the hope in the world. But if you have no love connected to it, then really you have nothing. Right. And you gain nothing. Right? So right. you can have all the faith that this relationship is going to work. You can have all the hope that this relationship is going to work. You can have all the faith that what you're doing to serve is absolutely right and all the hope that it will help them out. out. But if you have no love within it, if you're not serving with love, then it means absolutely nothing. You know, can, right. can we make this practical? I want to. I want to ask you a question, uh, yeah. my brother, because this is yeah. something that I'm dealing with right now, and I would actually yeah. love your advice. And yeah. if there's a listener on right now, and you want to respond to this when the uh, the, the after when we uh, open up questions, I would love to hear your advice as well too. Right. Um, but I, I was a part of this organization. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm no longer a part of the organization. But I, when I was there, I I, uh, I invested some some personal items of mine. As in a way, as a way of assisting the the organization to grow, blah blah blah. blah. But yeah. now that I'm no longer a part of that organization, um, yeah. would it be okay for me to ask that organization for my stuff back? Um, I I think if you if you feel like you need it, I mean it's it's kind of like saying, um, if you give somebody a hundred dollars just because mm-hmm. you allow them to borrow it, do you have to ask for it back? No, you don't have to ask for it back if you believe that you'll be perfectly fine without mm-hmm. having the hundred dollars, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess that question you would have to answer and say, what is your current need, right? Mm. If, if 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 you if you own say if say if you gave them some speakers, right? Mm-hmm. But if you buy speakers wholesale and you have your own store and you're making large profits every week, I don't really expect you to go ask these people for for your speakers back. Right. Right? So it, it would have to be upon what you believe is your current need. Like if I could, okay, so using the yes. term of the speakers, if I could use the speakers to glorify yes. God in my own way. Yes. If if you feel like there's no other way that you could possibly get some speakers and that it would be it would be a, a bigger loss to them than to you. Right? Mm. Because re, re, cause remember, God is working in, in the greater good. So if somebody passes away, it may be hurtful for us, but how many people were saved because that person passed away? Wow. Right? Wow. And, and, and that's kind of what I take on for my sister because 
You know what? I, I don't think we would be having this Bible study tonight if my sister were alive. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because, God bless because, her soul, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, because I would be living a totally different lifestyle. Maybe I would mm. be living a lifestyle that this, this life is my own. Right? Wow. So it, 